Hello, everyone. So today we want to discuss uh, innate versus adaptive immunity. Uh, we're also going to take a look at uh, humoral immunity. We're going to take a look at antibodies and antigens and the different types of antibodies that can be made and are produced by your immune system. So first, what we have to do is we have to understand what a pathogen is. And a pathogen is an agent capable of producing disease. Okay, so uh, things that could produce disease could be things like viruses, bacteria, fungus, lots of different things can get inside you and protect you. And you typically have three lines of defense against these various different types of pathogens. Okay, your first line of defense is going to be your skin and your mucous membranes. Okay, so the outermost layer of your skin, this, this epidermis that you have, is your first line of defense. Um, your epidermis is extremely good at keeping you healthy and keeping you safe. Uh, and it probably does the most work out of any of the other lines of defense because it's exposed to the world more than anything else is really, right? You're touching things all the time. You're, you're touching people all the time. You're, you're coming into contact with the air and the surroundings around you with your skin. And if you didn't have your skin, you'd probably be sick every second of the day because of how many things that you're touching. Now, the, the reason you're not sick all the time is because your epidermis is mostly dead cells, right? It's all keratinized dead cells. And pathogens don't like to live in dead cells. Pathogens can't survive in cells that are not uh, currently reproducing, right? That's what, um, that's what pathogens like viruses like. They like living tissue uh, because living tissue can reproduce. Living tissue can help reproduce viruses. Uh, living tissues have nutrients that they could use to survive and reproduce. So your your epidermis is not going to be very rich in things like that. So it, it's going to protect you against um, bacteria that land on you and viruses that land on you. Now, don't get me wrong. There are things that, that can uh, infect your epidermis, right? You can have things like athlete's foot, right? Which is a fungus that, you know, is, is flesh eating. Um, so there are things that can live on your epidermis, but for the most part, your epidermis and your skin and your mucous membranes are going to help protect you. Your mucous membranes, what are those? Okay. Those are the membranes that line, uh, your body cavities or your organs, like your digestive system, like your respiratory tract. And these are places that make or produce mucus, right? That's why they're called mucous membranes. And the reason that you produce mucus is so that you can, uh, defend against pathogens right? Mucus is thick, um, sticky liquid, uh, you know, liquid type material that is supposed to catch things before they get into your body, right? It's supposed to catch dust, it's supposed to catch bacterial cells, it's supposed to catch pathogens so that it doesn't get into your system, okay? And that's why we have mucus and mucus membranes, okay? So they're our first line of defense. Let's say the first line of defense fails, right? Maybe we have a cut on our skin, and that bacteria gets into the living tissue that's exposed at that wound. Let's say um, the mucus that is trapping pathogens in your body, let's say it doesn't drain very well. Say like you listen to my sinuses right now, okay? I have a little head cold. And the reason for that is there's mucus in my, in my sinuses that is not draining. And that's going to cause uh, bacterial growth in the mucus, okay? Um, so my first lines of defense did not suit me very well right now. So my second line of defense is my innate defenses. Okay. My, my innate defense mechanisms, innate defense mechanisms are things like leukocytes. Okay. Macrophages, antimicrobial proteins, things called natural killer cells, processes called inflammation, which you've heard of and fever, which you've also, I'm sure you've experienced both of those. Okay, I'm, I can almost guarantee you have. And we're going to talk about all of these things individually as this lecture goes, goes forward. Let's say that all of those secondary lines of defense don't or aren't um, successful in ridding your body of the pathogen. This happens, right? Okay, sometimes you get sick. You don't get sick very often, knock on wood. Okay, normal, healthy human beings typically get sick maybe two three times a year. Okay. If you get sick more than three or four times a year, you know, you might 
you might think about, you know, changing a lifestyle or, 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 you know, getting checked out for an allergy or something like that. But for the most part, you know, people are fairly healthy for most of the year. They get sick a couple times, but you're exposed to things so much that you're probably fighting a lot more pathogens than you think that you're fighting, right? You're not the three times that you're sick a year is not the only three times that you're exposed to pathogens, right? You're exposed to pathogens every day. So let's say your second line of defense fails, right? And you end up coming down with some type of infection, right? You come out down with the strep throat, you come down with tonsillitis, you come down with a sinus infection, you come down with common cold or the flu or COVID, whatever it is. Your third line of defense is called your adaptive immunity. Okay. And your adaptive immunity is, or what it wants to do is it wants to defeat a pathogen, right? It wants to destroy the, whatever pathogen is inside you that's making you sick. And it wants to give your immune system what we call a memory of what that pathogen was so that if you're ever infected with that pathogen again, you can deal with that pathogen quickly and effectively in the future. Okay. So that you don't get sick from a, a second exposure. And that's what a vaccine does, right? A vaccine is a, is an artificial way of uh, activating what we call adaptive immunity, right? And we want adaptive immunity. It's, it's the best way for us as a species to survive um, things like pandemics and to survive, you know, outbreaks of pathogens in the future. We want our body to remember what that pathogen is, what that pathogen looks like, how that pathogen works, and be able to fight it effectively if we are ever uh, exposed to it again. So we're going to kind of go in order, right? We're going we're gonna to talk about these three lines of defenses. We're going to talk about the innate and the adaptive immunity that's going to be the, the the bulk of this lecture okay so these innate defenses they guard equally against a broad range of pathogens okay did i skip yes yeah, i'm sorry okay well so what is a pathogen oh no i talked about this already oh, i apologize for that okay so your innate defenses these guard against equally against lots of different types of pathogens um the thing about the innate immunity is that it is localized it is non-specific and it lacks memory. Okay, so that's how it differs from the adaptive immune system. It's local, which means it's not going to travel around the body. It's going to be localized wherever the infection is occurring. It's nonspecific, okay, which means it can attack a multitude of different things without really needing uh, special uh, characteristics. And it's not going to produce memory. So it's, it's not going to remember what it does now in another exposure. Right. So if you get a certain, you know, pathogen uh, infection, the innate immune system, whatever it does to kill that pathogen now, it's not going to remember it the next time you're exposed to that pathogen. And that's just the nature of your innate immune system. OK, it's not that the innate immune system doesn't work. It's that's not the job of the innate immune system. So it doesn't do it. OK, so there are three types of ways that your innate immune system works. Number one, it uses proteins. It could use cells, specific cells to actually do um, the defense against the pathogen. Or there are processes that it could cause your body to have or take to defend you against pathogens. Okay. The, you know, opposite of that would be your adaptive immune system, where your body develops a separate immunity to each specific pathogen. Right. So it is specific. OK, the body adapts to a pathogen and wards it off more easily upon future exposure, which is what we call memory. Right. So, again, innate is local where adaptive is uh, around the entire body. OK, I don't want to say globally because your body's on a globe, but you get what I'm saying. Right. Um, Non-specific for innate. Very specific for adaptive lacks memory, which means it does not remember or help ward off uh, a pathogen during a secondary exposure. Adaptive has a memory so that it can ward off that pathogen on a future exposure. Okay, so let's talk about your skin, right? Your skin uh, makes it very mechanically difficult for microorganisms to enter the body. Like I said before, your cells on your epidermis are mostly 
keratinized, right? And what that means is that they are full of this very tough protein called keratin. And, you know, cells that are full of keratin are typically dead. And if you remember way back from the first semester of, of anatomy and physiology, um, your, your epidermis kind of grows from the inside out, right? The, the, more, the more deep you go into the, into the layers of epidermis, the more alive, the less keratin those cells have. And as those cells get pushed towards the surface of your, of your skin, they become more and more and more keratinized and essentially more and more and more dead, okay? What that does to those cells is it dries them out and it de deplenishes their nutrients, right? It depletes, sorry, it depletes their nutrients. And that's not good for microbial growth, okay? Um, bacteria and viruses, especially bacteria, they need nutrients. They need nutrients to survive and to reproduce. They need moisture. They need water, just like you do, okay? So the, just the overall nature of your skin is not great for microbial growth. There's something called an acid mantle, which is a thin film of lactic acid and fatty acids from your sweat that cover your skin. Okay, your sweat does two things. It, number one, it cools you down when, you, when your body temperature rises. It's a, you know, it's a negative feedback mechanism that is going to help you know, bring you back to homeostasis. And it cools you down when your body temperature goes high. But it, sweat, the acidic nature of your sweat, is also going to be a very, very good antimicrobial um, agent. Kind of like, you know, if you spray Lysol on something, right? That, that would be your body's equivalent of, you know, hand sanitizer, so to speak. Okay. Dermocidin and defensins. These are peptides. These are proteins. So the peptide is, these are proteins in the skin that are going to help kill microbes. Okay. And those are part of your acid mantle as well. Your mucous membranes. So that was your skin. So now let's talk about your mucous membranes. These are things that line, or these are membranes that line your digestive tract. These are membranes that line your respiratory and your urinary and your reproductive tracts. And if you notice, if you take a look at all those things we just named, digestive, respiratory, urinary, reproductive tracts, these are all organ systems that are open to the exterior of the world, right? Open to, to the exterior of your body, right? Um, these are areas that air that you breathe in gets into. Um, bodily fluids can be exchanged through these areas, okay? These are all areas that are very susceptible to pathogens because they are living tissue. Okay, unlike they're not keratinized like your skin, these are very, very much alive. These are very much non keratinized. They have lots of nutrients. Your digestive, your epithelial cells, if you think back to your tissue chapters and you talk about your you know, simple cuboidals and your you know, pseudo stratified columnars and all that other epithelial cells that you learned about, those are all very living cells that line all of these particular you know, organ systems. So you need some type of protection for those membranes. And the thing that's going to help protect those membranes are the mucus that's produced by those membranes, okay? And what the mucus does is it physically traps microbes. It's kind of like flypaper, if you think about it. Flypaper is, you know, basically uh, tape with glue on it, right? And you put it down and a fly lands on it and it can't get off. And then the fly ends up dying because it can't get off the flypaper. That's what happens with your mucus. Okay, your mucus traps dust, traps pollen, traps bacterial cells. When you smoke, okay, if you smoke cigarettes, okay, I know that's not uh, as popular as it used to be, but uh, cigarettes have lots of chemicals in them, and those chemicals can get caught in the mucus. Okay, and you know your body tries to to catch as much of that stuff as possible. Okay, your mucus also has things called lysozymes. Okay, lysozymes are enzymes that help destroy the cell walls of bacteria. Okay, which are going to help keep you safe from bacterial infection. So that was the first part. If we go back to our list here, that was our protective proteins, right? Those mucous membranes that have the enzymes in them. Okay, our skin that has uh, the enzymes in our sweat. Okay, those are protective proteins. 
Next thing we're going to talk about is protective cells. Okay, so our protective cells are called phagocytes. Okay, and a phagocyte is a cell that engulfs foreign matter. We spoke about this in another uh, in another chapter, and this is where you know things like a monocyte um, or any of these uh, leukocytes that you see here in the list actually use their cell membranes to engulf and surround a pathogen in order to kill it. Okay, so these are five types of leukocytes. Okay, so let's talk about each one of these a little bit more in depthly. Okay, neutrophil, okay, which is a type of leukocyte, is going to wander in your connective tissue and help to kill bacteria. The way it kills bacteria is it, it's going to use this phagocytosis process that I just mentioned, this engulfing or surrounding of its membrane around a bacterial cell or a pathogen, and it's going to digest it. Okay. It can kill by producing what we call a cloud of bacter uh, bactericidal chemicals. Okay, there are lysosomes within the neutrophils. And if you think all the way back to your cell biology, lysosomes are going to be that organelle that is going to hold hydrolytic enzymes or enzymes that are going to help to help cells burst um, or degrade material that it needs them to degrade. Okay, so these lysosomes can degranulate, and when they degranulate, when, what that means is the lysosomes are going to break down. Okay, so uh, if you think about this lysosome, it's think about it as like a as like a Tupperware container that's full of you know acid, right? And that acid, uh, if that acid touches anything, it's going to cause whatever it touches to you know degrade, okay, or break down. What the lysosome does, or what that that Rubbermaid container does, is it degrades, and when that it degrades on on activation, right? The the cell wants that that Rubbermaid container to to degrade in order to release the contents inside. Okay, so that's what a neutrophil will do. A neutrophil will take that Rubbermaid container full of the acid. It will degrade the the Rubbermaid container or open up the Rubbermaid container, releasing the uh, enzymes inside, which will help digest the bacteria that it has um, phagocytized or engulfed. Okay. This can cause a killing zone around a neutrophil. Okay. And what that can do is that can destroy several bacterial cells at once. Right. So if you, if you empty out your, all your lysosomes inside of you, okay, that can cause like a cloud of chemicals that surround you. And all those chemicals can help kill surrounding bacteria if there sur are surrounding bacteria or around that particular neutrophil. Okay, and e eosinophil, these are found uh, especially in your mucous membranes of the digestive system, the respiratory tract, okay, all those things we mentioned before. These guard primarily against parasites and allergens, or, okay, or allergy-causing agents, as well as other pathogens. But uh, the big thing here with eosinophils is the parasites and the allergens. Allergens could be pollen. Allergens could be proteins, you know, produced by shellfish, okay, things like that. Okay, uh, tapeworms, that's a parasite. Roundworms, those are parasites. Okay, they help to kill those by producing something called superoxide. Okay, superoxide, hydrogen peroxide. These are chemicals that use oxygen in order to kill or to destroy uh, bacterial cell walls. Okay, oxygen is very a very caustic um, atom, okay, or a very caustic uh, chemical. To us, we use it and we utilize it for respiration, but oxygen is not, does not necessarily uh, act friendly or play nice with everything. Okay. And superoxides, like that's why you put hydrogen peroxide on a, on a cut, right? You, you, if you have a wound and you, you don't want to get infected, you put peroxide on it. And what the peroxide is doing is it's using the oxygens. Peroxide is H2O2. And what the peroxide does is it releases those oxygens onto the bacteria and those, back, those oxygens could help break down the cell walls of those bacterial cells. And that's why you see bubbling, right? If you have bacteria in the wound, or if you think you have an infection in, in a cut and you pour the peroxide on it, it bubbles up. It's bubbling up because of the release of the oxygen from the hydrogen peroxide. And, you know, that, that could mean you, you might have a slight, you know, bacterial presence in that, in that wound. Okay. 
Eosinophils can also promote the action of basophils in mast cells. So not only can it actually kill things by producing uh, chemicals, it can actually ask for help from other cells like basophils and mast cells. And then, of course, it can phagocytize the antigen, okay? Or the antigen antibody complexes, which we will see later on in the humoral um, immunity section of the lecture. Basophils, okay, basophils secrete chemicals that aid mobility and action of other leukocytes. So they are going to call for help. Okay, that's basically what basophils do. They also produce leukotrienes, okay? And leukotrienes are gonna be chemicals that help to activate and attract other leukocytes, specifically neutrophils and eosinophils, okay? Basophils also produce histamines, okay? Which is a vasodilator. What that means is it, it causes your uh, blood vessels to increase in diameter, okay? When you have a dilated pupil, that means your pupils got really big, right? Drugs um, can make your uh, pupils dilate and stay dilated, right? If you're on, if you take certain drugs, that's what, you know, police officers look for when they shine a flashlight in your eyes. They want to see if your pupils are dilated because a lot of drugs will have that effect on you. Um, but a vasodilator will increase your blood vessel diameter and when you increase, it's like a pipe in a in a in plumbing. If you increase the size of the pipe, you're going to have more ability to for liquids to flow through that pipe, right? So if you have a a, a larger diameter um, blood vessel, blood flow should increase through that blood vessel if if it's dilated. Why do we want that? Okay, we want that because blood flow will speed up healing. It will also help you, you know, to to bring back. Um, nutrients to that area. Okay. And it'll speed up the leukocyte delivery to that area. So more white blood cells can get to that area. Okay. Sometimes that causes you some issues, right? Uh, sometimes that happens when you're um, exposed to pollen and your body produces histamine and these vasodilators occur and that could cause inflammation and inflammation can cause um, mucus production. And then what, what do you do? You take something called an antihistamine right? You take something that's going to reduce the amount of histamine being produced inside of you so that the symptoms of the runny nose, the symptoms of the mucus production, the symptoms of the, the sinus swelling goes down because that histamine is causing all those symptoms to occur. Okay. Basophils also secrete heparin. We talked about heparin, heparin in an earlier uh, lecture. Heparin is like what you find in like aspirins. Okay, and it inhibits clot formation. Okay, anyone who's uh, had surgery, especially open heart surgery, uh, they put them on, um, you know, blood thinners. Really, uh, as soon as they're done with their operations, you know, these are extensive operations like you know hip replacements, knee replacements, open heart surgeries, because you don't want clots to form due to inactivity, right? When after you have an operation like that, you're typically in bed for a, a you know, couple of days. And inactivity like that can possibly cause clot formations while you're trying to heal. Uh, and you don't want that to happen. So you take blood thinners. Okay, heparin is one of those things that is a blood thinner. And basophils will produce heparin so that clots do not form. And why don't you want clots to form? Because you want, you're trying to get, your, your job as a basophil is to get other cells to the area as quick as possible, right? You're, you're, you're producing histamine to make the, the roadways larger so that they can get there quicker. Um, you don't want anything getting in the way of these cells getting to the actual area. So you make the blood even thinner so it can't clot because the clots could potentially stop cells from getting to the infection or potentially getting to the, the pathogen um, so that it could be killed or destroyed. Okay, so now let, let's talk about our lymphocytes a little bit. Okay, let's talk about lymphocytes. You have three major categories of lymphocyte. You have the T cell and the B cell. Okay, and we'll talk about those a lot more in depthly later. And then you have the natural killer cell or the NK cell. Okay, the natural killer cell. In your blood, the majority of the lymphocytes that you have, okay, 80% of the lymphocytes that you have are going to be of the T cell variety. And that's because you have different types of B, uh, T cells. You have 
you know, T helper cells, you have cytotoxic T cells, you have memory T cells, you have lots of different types of T cells. So it, it, it makes a lot of sense that the majority of the cells in your blood are going to be T cell variety. 15% of the lymphocytes in your blood are going to be B cells. And those are going to be cells that produce antibodies. And we'll talk about those later. And the least amount of um, lymphocytes that you have in your blood are going to be of the natural killer cell variety. Okay. And that's only going to be 5%. T cells and B cells are going to be part of your adaptive immunity. Okay. Your natural killer cells are the only cells that are part of your innate immunity. Okay. Out of these lymphocytes. Okay, so natural killer cells are part of the innate immunity. All others are part of the adaptive immunity. Okay, helper T cells can function in both, and you'll see why later. Monocytes. Okay, monocytes are going to emigrate from the blood into connective tissues and transform to things called macrophages. Macrophages are going to be the largest of all these phagocytic cells. They're very, very big in comparison to all the other ones. And they are very, very avid phagocytic cells. They wander around. They, they, they come in two varieties. They could be wandering macrophages where they literally wander around the circulatory system and the uh, lymphatic system, actively seeking out pathogens, looking for trouble, so to speak. Okay. They're widely distributed in your, in your loose connective tissues. And the other variety is called a fixed macrophage, which are macrophages that you're only going to find in specific places. And they're only going to phagocytize pathogens that come to them. They're not going to actively going around looking for them. But if something happens to pass them that they feel uh, needs to be taken care of, they will take care of it. And here are three examples of fixed macrophages. Microglia. Okay, you might have heard that word in the uh, nervous system chapter last semester. Okay. I know my class, we talked about different types of, um, cells of the nervous system that, that aid the neurons. Okay. We talked about lots of different things like satellite cells and dendritic cells and microglial cells that are there to aid neurons. Okay. So the macrophage that we find in the central nervous system is called microglial cells. And they are there to, to kind of like pick up debris that surround the neurons. Alveolar macrophages. These are going to be macrophages found in the lungs. Okay. Alveolar refers to the alveolar air sacs. Okay. In the lungs. And stellate macrophages are going to be macrophages in the liver. Okay. So if things enter the liver that need to be taken care of or phagocytized, the stellate macrophages take care of those. Okay, let's talk about some other antimicrobial proteins that the innate immune system utilizes. Proteins that inhibit microbial reproduction and provide short-term innate immunity to pathogenic bacteria and viruses. So again, short-term, which means it does not remember, right? These are things that, these are proteins. These are not cells. These are just proteins that are going to like give you short-term innate immunity. So it's, it's kind of like, if you want to think of like the drug world, right? If you take a look at NyQuil, right? NyQuil is not medicine. Okay. NyQuil is a symptom reliever. And if you look at the back of NyQuil, it says, you know, for temporary relief from headache, runny nose, fever, temporary, right? That's kind of what this is, right? If you wanted to get rid of a bacterial infection, you're not going to take NyQuil. NyQuil doesn't get rid of anything. NyQuil makes you feel better for a little while so you can get through work, okay, or you can get through school, okay, but it's not going to cure you. That's when you take penicillin, you take Augmentin, you take something like that, okay? So these antimicrobial proteins are short-term innate responses to bacteria and viruses. You have two basic families of these antimicrobial proteins. You have things called interferons which are going to do exactly what you think they're, they're going to interfere with bacteria okay, or pathogens. And then you have something called the complement system. Okay. And we'll talk about those a little bit more. Okay. So what an interferon does, interferons are secreted by cells that are infected. Okay. So you have a cell 
it's already infected, okay? And it's specifically infected by viruses. That cell is a goner. That cell is not gonna be able to um, help itself. That cell is not gonna be able to uninfect itself. The last thing that cell wants to do before it explodes, because that's basically what happens when you're infected with a virus. When you get infected with a virus, that virus takes over your cell and causes your cell to make hundreds of more copies of that virus. And then once all those copies are put together, the virus makes your cell kind of explode or open so that all the viruses your cell just made can get out and infect surrounding cells. Well, what an interferon is, it's a protein that's secreted by a, by a, a body cell that's been infected that's going to try to alert the neighboring cells about the infection, right? So instead of your cells being completely unaware that you're even, there is even a problem, these interferons are produced, which attempt to bond to the surfaces of the neighboring cells so that they do not become infected with the virus. So what happens is let's say you have a liver cell, okay? And that liver cell, I could use any cell, but I just chose liver as the first thing that came to my head. So this liver cell has a virus infection. Okay, I say hepatitis, right? Hepatitis is injecting its DNA into your DNA. It's producing more hepatitis. Now you have a liver cell that is full of copies of hepatitis viruses, right? So one virus entered your liver cell but now inside that same liver cell are thousands of copies of hepatitis virus. That cell is going to explode eventually, and all hundred of those new hepatitis viruses can potentially go around to neighboring liver cells and infect a hundred potentially more liver cells. What that liver cell tries to do before it explodes, before it dies, is to release interferons. And those interferons are little chemicals, which are little warnings, right? They're little warning labels that are going to attach to the surface of the surrounding liver cells to tell them, listen, I was infected and you can't let this virus enter your, enter your cell because then it's going to kill more of us, right? It's a big warning system, okay? And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It all depends on the virus. It all depends on your genetics. It all depends on how well your immune system works but it's a way for your body to try to limit infection as much as it possibly can. A complement system, this is something that's a lot more involved and we don't, I'm not, I don't wanna to go too much into it, but if you go and you take a look at, you know, cell communication and how cells talk to one another, okay, complement systems are groups of proteins, 30 or more globular proteins that make powerful contributions to both the innate and adaptive immune system. Your liver produces these proteins, they circulate in the blood, and when uh, a pathogen is present, these um, proteins become activated, and basically what happens is one protein is going to activate another protein, which is going to activate another protein, which is going to activate another protein. It's like a big domino effect, right? So just picture yourself, you have a table full of dominoes. Those dominoes are not going to fall unless you flick that first domino, Okay. The complement system is the dominoes. They're all set up. They're all ready to go in your liver, being produced by your liver or floating around in your circulatory system. The finger that flicks that first domino is the presence of a pathogen. Okay. And once one gets activated, okay, once that first domino, once that first complement system protein gets activated by the presence of a pathogen, it tells another complement system protein, which tells another protein, which tells another protein, which tells another protein, which tells another protein, which eventually, hopefully, gets you some type of response. It, it gets you uh, the production of some type of um, chemical that's going to help reduce the infection. It's going to produce a chemical that calls for aid from other cells. Something's going to happen, but it's a complement system where it's a cascading system of one chemical talking to another, talking to another, talking to another. And that's what the complement system is. 
Okay, so let's let's go back to these natural killer cells. These one of these, you know, uh, lymphocytes that's going to be part of the innate immune system rather than the adaptive immune system. Okay, natural killer cells are exactly what they're called. I think that's the that's the coolest name of all the different types of of immune cells that you have. Okay, natural killer cells, pretty pretty badass. Okay, it's can they these continuously patrol the body looking for pathogens and diseased host cells. That's what they do. They, they go around the body looking for pathogens, looking for cells that are diseased. And that's what, a, that's what, a, that's what we call uh, a cell that's been infected. We call that a host, right? So when your liver cell got infected with that hepatitis, that liver cell is now a host. Okay, it's being used by the virus. Natural killer cells attack and destroy bacteria. They could also attack transplanted cells, right? Uh, your, your natural killer cells do not know the difference between, um, you know, a bacteria necessarily that's trying to infect you or, you know, a liver transplant that you received in the hospital. All that natural killer cell knows is that this, these cells are not part of you. They weren't part of you a minute ago. Now they're, now they're inside you. They could potentially make us sick. We got to kill it. Okay. Uh, they can destroy uh, infected cells with viruses. They can even, you know, they've been known to destroy cancer cells. And we'll talk about that as well. So what they do is they recognize an enemy cell, they bind to it, and they release proteins called perforins. And basically what a perforin is, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. A perforin is, is kind of like a straw. Okay, it's like a protein straw. And if you can imagine, like, if you had an orange and you wanted to get... You had a you had a vial of liquid, right? And you wanted to get that liquid into the orange. There's a couple of ways you could you could go about that. One way would be to make a tunnel, right? You would you can kind of build a tunnel through the orange, through the skin of the orange, and inject that liquid in that vial into the center of the orange. Because if you just pour the liquid over the surface of the orange, it's not going to penetrate this, the orange rinds, right? So, but if you take a straw and you stick a straw through the orange, you now have a tunnel, essentially, that you've built that spans the cell membrane and the cell wall of that orange, the rind, right, the, the skin on the outside of the orange. You can now have exposed the inside of that orange to the exterior, and that's what a natural killer cell does. It, it basically builds a, a protein straw that can penetrate the membrane of a, of a pathogen. And once it builds that protein straw, it can then secrete protein degrading enzymes called granzymes through that straw, which are going to cause apoptosis or the death of of that particular cell, right? So this could be a cell that's, like I said, this could be a cancer cell. This could be a cell that's infected with a virus. This could be a cell that's been transplanted. It could be a bacterial cell, it doesn't matter. This natural killer cell is gonna produce this protein straw and then use that protein straw to deliver chemicals that are gonna cause that cell to kill itself. And that process of the cell killing itself is called apoptosis. Here's a picture of it. Okay, so here's a cell that, you know, it's being labeled an enemy cell, but this cell could be a cancer cell. This cell could be a cell that's a, a host to a virus. This could be a bacterial cell. This could be a liver cell from a, from a transplant. This natural killer cell here, this tiny little natural killer cell, recognizes that this is an enemy, re re thinks that this is a cell that should not be in the body. So what it's going to do, it's going to build this little protein straw from these perforins. And then it's going to release chemicals called granzymes and use that protein straw to enter that enemy cell. That enemy cell is going to react with those granzymes and it's gonna kill itself. And then another cell called a macrophage, which like I said before, is one of those very, very large um, white blood cells that we have, can now engulf this dying cell or this apoptotic cell and get rid of it and recycle it and be gone with it. So let's talk about some processes that the body does 
to try to keep you safe from pathogens. Okay, a fever is one thing, and, and we've all had fevers, right? We've all had um, a temperature go above 98.6 degrees. Some of us have had, you know, slight fevers. Okay, some of us have had 99, 100, 101. Some people have really extreme fevers. Some people can go up to 103, 104. Okay. And, you know, your body has limits to how high it can go. And, you know, if you hit a certain temperature range, you should definitely seek, uh, you know, medical attention. Okay. And a fever is actually a good thing. And what a fever is, the definition of a fever is an abnormal elevation of body temperature. And the synonym of a fever, the, the medical terminology for a fever is called pyrexia. So if you see pyrexia on a, on a chart or if you see pyrexia on like the symptoms card in a, in a drug, okay, I was looking on, I was trying to look up symptoms of COVID for a particular, uh, for a particular symptom. And, you know, it, it lists all the different symptoms of COVID and, and pyrexia was on there. And I was like, how is someone going to, you know, someone who's not, you know, fluent in this, in medical terminology, going to understand what, what pyrexia means when they read this, you know, if someone was just Googling that, but that's what it means. It means fever. Okay. It means an abnormal elevation of body temperature and you can get fevers in lots of different ways. You can get fevers from a trauma, right? If you hit your thumb, um, with a hammer, you're going to get an inf inflammation and that might, you know, cause a, a swelling and things like that. But, um, fevers are typically going to be due to infections, right? You can get a fever from a drug interaction, uh, brain tumors. Okay. Lots of, lots of things can cause fevers. Okay. Um, and what a fever is, is it's an adaptive defense mechanism that is supposed to do more harm than good. Uh, it's supposed to do more good than harm. Okay. And it, it promotes interferon activity. Remember we said that interferons were those chemicals that are going to be released by cells that have been infected so that other cells don't get infected. Right. So fevers are going to help promote that. Right. Fevers are going to tell cells that are infected, listen, make interferon so that other cells don't get infected. So it's supposed to stop the spread of infection. Right. The heat of it all. Right. The, the rise in this in this temperature should inhibit the back, the reproduction of bacteria and the reproduction of viruses. Viruses like to be at certain temperatures. And if your body temperature goes above that temperature, it could potentially stop that bacteria from growing or stop that virus from reproducing. So that's what, another reason you get a fever. It's also going to elevate your metabolic rate, which could hopefully accelerate the repair of your tissues. Okay. But most of the time, once we have a fever, we're pretty well into our infection, right? And we, we need some type of medical uh, interaction with some type of uh, antibiotic or antiviral drug once we have a fever. Once we have a fever, you, you know that the infection has has gotten through to that third line of defense almost, right? Inflammation. Okay. Now I had kind of spoken about hitting your thumb and then I, I kind of spoke out of, out of term a little bit. I, I was about to talk about inflammation. And then I realized I was talking about fevers, but inflammation is the local defense response to a tissue injury, which could be a trauma or an infection. All right. So if you hit your thumb with a hammer, Okay, your thumb is going to be inflamed and your thumb is going to be swollen and it's going to be a lot bigger than the thumb that you didn't hit with a hammer. But you don't have an infection, right? Inflammation does not need to be caused by an infection of a pathogen or any or a virus or a bacteria or anything like that. Okay, inflammation can be caused by injury or infection alike. Okay, the general purpose of inflammation, what is it supposed to do? It's supposed to limit the spread of the pathogen. Okay, because if you swell the area up, things are going to have trouble leaving that area, right? And that's why it's swelling up. It's swelling up so that things can't leave, right? When you have sinus pressure, um, typically before you have a sinus infection, you have sinus pressure and you have inflammation in the sinuses, which stop the mucus from draining out of your sinuses. So that's what inflammation does. It tries to keep everything in one area, stopping it from spreading. Right. That's the whole point of inflammation to stop the spread of whatever is in that area. OK. It's going to remove debris and damaged tissue. OK. Inflammation is going to help remove debris from damaged tissues. It's going to help initiate tissue repair. 
by calling for other cells. And the cardinal signs of inflammation are going to be redness, obviously, swelling, heat, and pain. Okay, those are all things that we feel when something is inflamed or swollen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so that was the innate immune system. So now we want to start talking about the adaptive immune system. Okay. So the immune system in general is a large population of widely distributed cells that recognize foreign substances and act to neutralize or destroy them. Right. So that's what we've learned so far. It's a large amount of different types of cells that do lots of different types of things to, to cells or particles that they do not recognize. And these things vary from bacteria to viruses to pollen to dust and all other types of things. There are three characteristics that distinguish your innate immune system from your adaptive. Number one is that it's, it's a systemic effect. Remember I said earlier, I said global, okay? The correct term for around the entire body is systemic, right? When you have a systemic infection, that's, a, that's an infection that's around your whole body. Okay, so your innate immune system is very localized. It's going to happen where the infection is occurring. Systemic means, or the adaptive immunity is systemic, which means it's, it, it travels throughout your body constantly. Okay, the specificity, specificity of the adaptive immunity, that means this immunity is directed against particular pathogens. Okay, and we'll see why, right? B cells are going to make antibodies for specific things, right? They're not just gonna kill whatever they see, they're gonna make antibodies, they're gonna cut up their DNA and produce different proteins for very specific pathogens. And the thing that's probably the most important about adaptive immunity, and it, it kind of lends to the name adaptive, is the memory aspect of your adaptive immunity, okay? When re-exposed to, to a pathogen again, your body can react quickly so that there is no noticeable illness the second time or the subsequent times that you are exposed. Okay, I like to bring up uh, chicken pox to my, to my students all the time. When I was a kid, okay, which it's getting to be longer and longer ago, but when I was a kid back in the 80s, we didn't have chicken pox vaccinations. Okay, nowadays, everybody, you know, everyone that I teach typically that's, you know, in their early 20s, has a chicken pox vaccine. They've never had chicken pox before, right? When I was a kid, you had to get chicken pox. You were almost forced to get chicken pox. If someone in your friend group got chicken pox, that person a lot of times had a pox party, which is where all the friends in the neighborhood were forced to go hang out with the kid who had chicken pox. If you don't know what chicken pox is, it, it looks like a whole bunch of little scabs all over your skin, all over your body, your face, your arms, your your torso, your legs, everywhere, okay, sometimes even inside your mouth, okay, and they're very, very itchy. Chicken pox are extremely itchy, and it lasts, a, you know, a week or so, and then all they all go away. They fall off. All the scabs fall off, but it's really highly contagious. So, like, for me, my my older brother got chicken pox, and my mom told me, get in bed with, with, with your brother, and I'm like, but I don't want to. He, he's got He's got scabs all over him. He's, you know, he's sick. She's like, get in bed, watch the Smurfs, which was a cartoon back in the day. Watch the Smurfs and hang out, hang out with your brother. And then the next day I had chicken pox. But the thing is, once you get chicken pox, you don't get chicken pox anymore because your body remembers the antigen. Your body creates this adaptive immunity for the pathogen so that if you are ever exposed to chicken pox again, you don't ever get a symptom and you don't even know you've ever exposed again. Okay. Now, yes, chicken pox can come back later in life as, um, oh, what do you call it when it's later in life? I forget. I'll, I'll think of it later. Okay. Um, but the, the, the point of it is that it, it's a memory that is produced by your adaptive immunity so that if you are exposed again, that you won't get an illness, not shackles. Oh, I can't believe I'm having a brain fart about this. Okay. Somebody's screaming at the, at the computer right now, telling me what the, uh, what adult onset, uh, chicken pox is, which I should know, but I'm a little under the weather. So my brain's not working as, 
as well as it should be. So you have two types of adaptive immunity, okay? You have <clears throat> cell-mediated immunity, which we are going to have an entire lecture on, okay, by itself, but we'll talk about it a little bit today. But you have cell-mediated immunity, and what that is, is those are lymphocytes that directly attack and destroy foreign cells or diseased host cells. Okay, so you have, these, are, these are adaptive immune cells that are going to directly attack foreign cells, bacteria, viruses, fungus, or diseased host cells, cells that are already um, infected with a bacteria or a virus. Okay. They are also going to rid the body of these pathogens. And where they are inaccessible to antibodies, they're going to kill cells that harbor pathogens. Okay, so they're going to kill hosts. That's basically what that's saying. They're going to kill hosts. Okay. And then we have the humoral immunity. So we have cell mediated immunity and we have humoral immunity. And humoral immunity can be also termed antibody mediated immunity. Okay, humoral immunity is when you produce antibodies against pathogens. Okay. So mediated by antibiotics, or I'm sorry, mediated by antibodies that do not directly destroy a pathogen, but tag it for destruction. So that's one thing that a lot of my students are unaware of prior to this lecture is that antibodies don't actually kill anything. Okay. And a lot of people don't are unaware of that. Okay. When you get tested for COVID antibodies, you think you're getting tested for these things that are being made to kill um, COVID. That's not what they're looking for. They're looking for antibodies which are produced by your adaptive immunity to label covid so that covid can be killed by something else later on okay so for instance let's say i take my friend joe i have a really good friend named joe he works in the new york uh, city area in nursing homes during the covid the early covid pandemic he never he never showed any signs of having COVID, but he was exposed to people with COVID all the time um, in this nursing home because he's a physical therapist that works in a nursing home. He decided, because the, the pandemic started around March 2020, he, he got tested for antibodies, I want to say in June or July of that year, and he was positive for the antibodies but he was asymptomatic, which means he did not show any symptoms of COVID-19. But what he was tested for was when you test for antibodies, you're testing to see if you were exposed to COVID-19, okay? And the answer was yes, because his body has the antibodies against COVID-19, that means that he was exposed to it. COVID-19 was in his system. And his adaptive immunity, his antibody-mediated section of his adaptive immunity, was able to produce antibodies that surrounded COVID-19 and then remembered, because remember, adaptive immunity has a memory aspect to it, his body, if he's, he's re-exposed to COVID, can use those same antibodies that were made to kill off COVID in the future if he was ever exposed. Okay, so the presence of, if he, because he was asymptomatic, he's not gonna get tested for COVID, okay? He's gonna get tested for the antibodies. You only give the COVID test to people who have symptoms, right? If you have fever, runny nose, cough, chest pain, right? Pyrexia, all that stuff. You give the COVID test to see if you currently have COVID. If you are, if you never had any symptoms, but you want to know if you've been exposed to COVID, you take an antibody test, okay? And these antibodies, again, don't destroy the pathogen. They tag the pathogen for destruction. So it's kind of like a, uh, one thing that I used to do in, in, in class, you know, when, when we're on campus is I'll take a post-it note 
and I'll be a B cell, right? Because B cells are the, are the cells that do this antibody mediated immunity. I'll walk around the room and I'll stick a sticky note or post-it note onto one student in the classroom. And I'll say that one student is a pathogen. And I'm not, I'm a B cell. I'm not going to kill that pathogen. I'm just going to put a lay, I'm going to put a sticky note on that pathogen so that other cells that do the killing know that that's a bad cell. I'm not going to put labels on any other cells because all the other cells in the room, all the other kids in the room are normal cells that are supposed to be there. They, they might be tissue cells. They might be muscle cells. They might be liver cells, bone cells. But that one kid that I put the note on is a pathogen and I label him for destruction. I don't actually do the destruction. I label him for destruction. And then I remember that that label that I put on that individual is very, very specific. Okay. I will never use that same sticky note for any other pathogen that ever enters the body. That particular sticky note, the shape of that sticky note, the color of that sticky note, the size of that sticky note is going to be specific for that particular pathogen. And I will never, ever, ever use it for any other pathogen again. If I come in contact with another pathogen, I'll use a different sticky note that's slightly bigger or a different color or maybe a different shape. Okay, but I'll never use that same path, uh, that same antibody, that same sticky note twice. And those sticky notes are the antibodies. Okay. And those antibodies are effective against viruses, bacteria, yeast, protozoans, okay, toxins, okay, uh, venoms, allergens, okay, anything that really is in the body that's not a self cell, that, that's not something that's supposed to be in your body is something that can be um, used for um, antibodies. So now you have natural active immunity in your adaptive immunity, but you also have artificial active immunity. The production of one's own antibodies or T cells as a result of an infection or natural exposure to an antigen is what we call natural active immunity. So my my story about me getting in bed with my brother when he had chicken pox, that was me getting exposed naturally, okay? Even though it was forced, it was still natural. It was me being exposed to an antigen. And then my body produced antibodies against chicken pox. So I don't need a vaccine for that, right? I was naturally exposed to that antigen and my body naturally produced antibodies for chickenpox so that if I was ever around anyone else again with chickenpox, I would not get chickenpox again. Shingles. There it is. It's shingles. That's when you get it when you're an adult. <laughs> it all comes full circle. See, when you stop thinking about it, it comes to you quick. Now, all the kids nowadays that have chickenpox vaccinations, you're this group. You're the artificial active immunity section. Okay. So I have a natural active immunity to chicken pox because I was exposed to the antigen naturally and my body made antibodies against the actual antigen, right? It was, it was the real thing. It was, it was 100% the real chicken pox virus that made me sick and I produce antibodies for it. Someone who has artificial active immunity is someone who produces your own antibodies as a result of a vaccination against the disease. Okay, so what a vaccine does is it gives you a portion of the, the pathogen and it tricks your body into, think, into thinking you're actually sick when you're actually not sick, but the same result happens. The result is antibodies are produced against that pathogen. So, for instance, I have a coffee mug or a water bottle, okay? That water bottle itself, that plastic water bottle, is a vessel for the water that's inside the bottle, okay? Think of this as a virus. A virus has a protein coat on the outside of it that is the vessel for the genetic information inside the virus, right? Every virus has its own genetic information. That could be DNA, it could be RNA, but inside of the virus is this genetic info and surrounding that genetic info is this protein coat. Okay, so the water bottle is the protein coat. The water inside is the genetic material. The part of the virus that makes you sick is the genetic info. Okay, that's what makes you sick. 
So what a vaccine is, well, there are different types of vaccines, but one very common type of vaccine will take the virus, which is the bottle and the liquid inside, and it will remove the liquid inside, which is the part that makes you sick. It's the genetic information, the viral genome. And it leaves the plastic bottle, that plastic outer shell. And that doesn't make you sick. Okay. That doesn't actually infect you. Okay. The, the thing that really kills your cells is the fact that the, the genome inside, the genetic information inside is infecting your cells. So what vaccines do is they remove the infectious part. They remove the water from the bottle and then they inject you with a whole bunch of empty bottles. And your body doesn't know that those bottles are empty. Can't see inside of them, right? It's not a clear plastic like, like you have. You can't tell just by looking at it that it's, it doesn't have some type of infectious part inside it. So your body attempts to destroy it as if it's the real thing. And when it does that, it produces antibodies. And then if you're ever exposed to chicken pox or COVID-19 or polio, you won't ever have symptoms. And it, it'll be the same response, but just one was done naturally, like me hanging out with my brother watching the Smurfs getting chicken pox, or you, or potentially you, or someone you know, that got a vaccination for that same disease or for that same uh, pathogen. Some... Uh, vaccines require booster shots. Okay, I know COVID requires two shots of of the vaccine, uh, and the dose, from what I understand, the dose in the second uh, shot is a lot more than in the first shot, which uh, could give you a reaction. And don't forget, your body thinks you're sick. Okay, your body thinks that you are infected with a pathogen, so it's very, very common that you get some type of symptom, right? And that's that's true of all vaccines. Okay, if you get uh, an MMR vaccine, a mumps, measles, uh, rubella vaccine, or if you get um, um, chickenpox vaccines, or if you get the influenza vaccination, you could have you know symptoms of those diseases for a day or two while your body tries to fight it off. Okay, because those symptoms are due to the immune response, right? Those the symptoms aren't due to you being infected with the virus because you you don't even have the real virus in you. The symptoms are due to the response of your immune system producing inflammation to call for help from other cells. It's the production of uh, or the, the creation of a fever because your body wants to stop the spread. It thinks you're in, it thinks you're infected. So it wants to stop the spread. So it causes inflammation in areas. Okay. So your body's having this immune response to a fake, to a Trojan horse, essentially. Okay. Not knowing, but that's, that's artificial active immunity. Okay, natural passive immunity is uh, you could have temporary immunity that results from antib antibodies produced by another person. Okay, natural passive immunity is different than natural active immunity, right? Natural active immunity is your body producing antibodies. Natural passive immunity <clears throat> is you taking antibodies from someone else, right? So you, if you don't produce antibodies, right, let's say you are a fetus, right? You're a baby. Um, you're still in the womb. You don't have an immune system that's developed. You don't have B cells that have been exposed, right? When you're, when you, as you grow up, the more you're exposed to, the better your immune system gets, right? So that's the whole memory part, right? The more you're exposed to, the more your body remembers for the future. But when you're a baby, or, in, or if you're in the womb, you're not even born yet. You have zero memory because you've never been exposed, right? So how does a fetus or how does a baby um, have any type of protection against pathogens if they don't have any adaptive immunity yet? Well, they have natural passive immunity, which is temporary immunity that results from antibodies produced by someone else. In this case, it's the mother. Okay, if it's a fetus, antibodies are given to the fetus through the placenta from the mom. So the mom's antibodies are getting into the fetus's bloodstream through the placenta. If it's a newborn baby, this is why they stress to do breastfeeding. Okay, breastfeeding, they say, increases the amount of antibodies that the child gets. 
which is going to help the adaptive immune system of that child from a very, very early age. So that if it is exposed to pathogens, that it'll be <clears throat> a little bit better off than, than a baby that didn't do breastfeeding. Okay. Then you have artificial passive immunity. Okay. Artificial passive immunity is when you have temporary immunity. Again, it's only temporary because it's not your antibodies. Eventually you run out of them, right? And it's temporary immunity that results from the injection of immune serum or antibodies from another person or animal. An example of this would be antivenom of snake bites, okay, rabies shots, tetanus shots, okay, botulism, okay, botulism is a bacteria, okay, that you can get um, artificial passive immunity against, okay. And these are all things that are going to be temporary, but they're antibodies that are produced from another person or an animal. So for a snake bite, you would actually take antivenom, which is going to be antibodies from the snake itself, right? Because the, how, why doesn't the snake, if the snake is full of its own venom, why doesn't the snake die? Do you ever think of that? The snake doesn't die because it has antibodies protecting it from its venom. So we take the antibodies from the snake and inject them into you so that it counteracts the venom. Okay, so now let's talk about antigens and antibodies in general. Okay, an antigen is any molecule that triggers an immune response. They can be very large uh, molecular weights. They can have very complex structures. They can be made of proteins. They can be made of long chains of uh, sugars like polysaccharides, they could be sugar and protein combinations called glycoproteins, they could be um, sugar lipid combinations called glycoproteins. But one of the characteristics is they that your body can distinguish self from non self. Okay, your body can distinguish between an antigen, which is a non self or a foreign molecule. Okay, from something that's supposed to be there, right? Your body should be able to, to distinguish a liver cell from a bacterial cell, okay? By just looking at the surface proteins of the actual antigen. There are parts of an antigen that are going to be recognized by your immune system. And when they are recognized by your immune system, that stimulates a response. <clears throat> so if you have natural killer cells that find a diseased cell, that triggers an immune response. If you have a T lymphocyte or a B lymphocyte finding a, an antigen and labeling it or killing it, that's an immune response. The reason that they actually do the killing or the labeling in the first place is because they recognized that that thing, that antigen is not part of you. That B cell, that T cell, the natural killer cell, that macrophage, that whatever, it knows that this thing that's inside of you is not supposed to be there. How does it know that? How does it know that this bacteria is not part of your liver or that this bacteria is not part of your lungs or your throat tissue? or your mucous membranes. How does it know? It knows because antigens have things called epitopes. And an epitope is an antigenic determinant, which means it's a, it's a thing, it's a protein on the surface of these cells, bacterial cells, viral particles, whatever it is. It's a protein that's on top or the, sur the surface of these antigens that tells your immune system that these are not part of you. Okay, your, your own self cells are not going to have epitopes. Only antigens are going to have these epitopes. And your immune system is supposed to recognize cells that do not have these epitopes and cells that do. And that's what's going to cause the immune response. The presence of these epitopes stimulates an immune response in some way. We also have things called haptins. Haptins are small antigenic particles themselves, but they have to be in combination with 
other molecules in order to actually be recognized as an antigen. Okay, so haptins are these small, tiny little things that can bond to larger proteins. And once they bond to the larger protein, they can then be seen as an antigen. They're not seen as antigens by themselves. And the protein that they bond to is not necessarily seen as an antigen by itself either. But once that protein and those haptins connect, that produces a immune response because that haptin protein combination is then looked at as an antigen and that will trigger a response. So what has haptins? Where do haptins occur? Haptins can occur in cosmetics like makeups, um, detergents, different types of soaps, industrial chemicals like Windex and oven cleaners. Poison ivy can produce haptins. Animal dander, which is like the skin, the dead skin cells of animals can produce haptins. In some people, um, haptins can bond to penicillin and produce an allergic reaction. But all of these things, think about what these things can do. People can have allergic reactions to cosmetics. They can have allergic reactions to detergents, right? They can get rashes if these things come into contact with their skin. Because what happens when things come into contact with your skin? They get absorbed subcutaneously and they can enter your bloodstream. And you can have either very localized um, like rashes that, you know, don't necessarily travel systemically throughout you, but they are localized on your skin. If you put like for me, if I bring my dress shirts to a dry cleaner and they use starch on the collars, the starch irritates my neck. My neck is all red. My neck is, you know, has a rash. It's itchy. It's, it's painful. OK, so that is an example of these haptins, you know, combining with proteins in, in you know, on my body and uh, causing an immune response, right? My body doesn't like these things. It's trying to kill these things, trying to get rid of these things, and it's causing a rash on my body. Same thing with poison ivy, okay? And some people are allergic to penicillin. My dad is allergic to penicillin. Okay, let's talk about antibodies. <clears throat> antibodies are also called immunoglobulins, IgS, immunoglobulin. And it's a defensive gamma globulin found in blood plasma, tissue fluids, body secretions, and some leukocyte membranes. And if you go back to, you know, your, your early biochemistry, you have to know that proteins are made up of amino acids. Okay. And what a antibody is made of, antibodies are made of things called heavy chains, which are these large chains of amino acids. And then they have these things called short chains, which are shorter chains of amino acids. Okay, we'll take a look at one in a second. Okay, these short chains or these light chains have variable regions on them. Okay, and that's what makes antibodies very special. Remember I said before that, you know, I would stick a sticky note onto a, you know, uh, a person in the room and call that person the pathogen. And I would only use that very specific sticky note for that individual. A B cell, which is what I was acting as, has the ability to change the proteins or the antibodies that it's making to suit a specific pathogen. Okay. So let me just bring up this picture. This site right here, this antigen bonding site, that's like the sticky part of the sticky note. This is going to be the area that actually bonds to the antigen itself, labeling that antigen for destruction, right? Because that's what the label did. The label didn't actually kill the, 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 the pathogen. The label just makes sure that other cells know that this is a bad cell and make sure that it gets taken care of and kill it. That's what your B cells do. That's what antibodies do. So if you took an antibody test for COVID, your body saw COVID, put a label on COVID so that other cells could kill COVID later on, okay? And B cells are the cells that make antibodies. But B cells have the ability to change the shape as much as they want, okay? You actually have, you know, the ability to make trillions of different types of shapes in this area. And that's why I said that specific sticky note will only be used for that one antigen. So let's say this is for COVID, right? Let's say this is a COVID antibody. 
if we take a look at this U shape, this like, you know, stretched out wide U, and if this is used for COVID, it's never going to be used for anything else but COVID. Your, your B cell, your adaptive immunity is going to remember that this particular antigen uses this particular antibody, or we use this particular antibody on that specific antigen, which in this case, in my, in my example is COVID. So if you get infected with the flu, you're not going to use this antibody, right? The, the B cells are not going to produce this antibody if it sees the flu, because it produced this antibody strictly for COVID-19. It will change the shape. It has the, the B cells have the ability when it produces antibodies to change the shape. It can cut up its DNA and, and, and allow it to code for a different shape. Maybe the shape is a little bit thinner, right? Instead of it being this wide open, maybe it's still a U shape, but maybe it's a narrower U shape, or maybe it's, it's a V shape, or maybe it's a square shape, or maybe it's a star shape. It doesn't matter what shape it is. Okay. It's not going to be the same shape for two different, uh, it's not going to be the same shape for two different uh, antigens, right? This shape is specifically for COVID and, you know, chicken pox is going to have another specific shape and you know, polio will have another specific shape and measles and mumps and rubella are all going to have their own specific shapes. And that's the, that's the, the wonder of, of antibodies and how great they are. So we have lots of different types of antibodies, right? They're all called Ig, right? Immunoglobulin. And they come in different classes, okay? And they're named for their structure of certain regions on the, on the body here. So if we take a look at these C regions, these constant regions, these regions are regions that never change, okay? This, this area here, this purple area and this green area, these are areas that never change in a antibody. The only thing that changes in the antibody is these antigen bonding sites, which change shapes to bond to different antigens. So IgA has a certain C region. IgD has a certain C region. IgE has a certain C region. Their bonding sites change, but these are going to differ from IgA and from, to, from IgD and IgE and IgC and all those other things. Okay. So let's just talk about very briefly what they do individually. All right. So IgA, immunoglobulin A or antibody A, prevents pathogen adherence to epithelia and penetrating underlying tissue. So antibodies that fall into the A class are going to prevent pathogens from getting into your epithelial cells, your mucous membranes, your epi epidermis, things like that. These also provide passive immunity for newborns. IgD, these are going to help to activate B cells when antigens are present. IgE, immunoglobulin E, stimulates the release of histamines and other chemical mediators when, uh, of inflammation and of allergies. Okay, and these mediators of inflammation are going to attract eosinophils, especially when parasitic infections are present. Okay, so these are the, just the general actions of different types of antibodies. IgG, this is going to be the majority of the antibodies that circulate in the, in the body. Uh, these are the antibodies that cross the placenta to the fetus. Okay, and IgM, these are going to be secreted uh, in primary immune responses, uh, agglutination, which is like blood clotting, okay, and complement fixation, though that, that complement system of, you know, one thing um, activates another, which activates another, right? So all these different types of antibodies are going to have diff slight different um, jobs to do. And again, once I, I said this before, that human immune systems have the ability to make a trillion different types of antibodies. Like literally, that's not even a made up number. That's you can literally potentially make one trillion different types of antibodies. That doesn't mean your body does, right? It's not a guarantee that your body is going to make one trillion different types of antibodies, but it has the ability to if it needed to. You will never even you'll never be even be exposed to a trillion different types of of uh, pathogens where you will ever even need to make a trillion different types of antibodies. But if your body needed to, it has the ability to do so. Okay. How does it do that? How does it make a trillion different types of antibodies? 
especially when you only have 20,000 genes in the entire genome, right? You only have 20,000 genes that are, that are attributed to the traits that you have. So if you only have 20,000 genes, how can you make a trillion different variations of, of antibodies? And that's because of these two things. That's because of somatic recombination, which means that pieces of DNA in B cells, not, not all cells can do this, but B cells have the ability to shuffle your DNA up to create as many different um, combinations as possible. And that gives you the capability to make a trillion different types of antibodies. Okay, and hypermutations, okay? A lot of times mutations are thought of as, as negative, um, negative mutations where it could hurt you or harm you or kill you. Okay, but mutations are the reason that we're here, right? We're here because we have mutated from another species or another organism and we've become our own species or organism and something will eventually mutate uh, and become something different after us or after we're here. But mutations don't necessarily always have a negative connotation. They can be good. And those mutations can create new antibody sequences that can be produced for different antigens. And that is where we are going to stop for today. So hopefully you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please leave your questions in the chat uh, in our class. Or if you're not in my class and you're just watching this on YouTube, you can post comments um, below and ask me any questions you like, and I'll try to get back to you. Thanks. Have a good one.